Good morning. Um, I looked through most of your study guides, okay? Um, good stuff for the most part. But I do want to go over a couple of organelles that are important, especially for um, later on what we're going to do in the next couple of chapters, <clears throat> right, when we talk about cell respiration and photosynthesis. All right, so we're going to go cover the mitochondria and the chloroplast, and then we'll go into the cytoskeleton, okay, which you did not have to cover on your own. All right, but you covered elements of the endomembrane system, right, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, right, you covered the nucleus, et cetera. All right, so you are still responsible for those. Understood? Good. So... <clears throat> I don't know how long my voice is going to last, so we'll just go with it, all right? Mitochondria um, and chloroplasts, two organelles, and from those of you that did, already did this, where do they come from? What do they do? Well, I just said what they did, so you should be able to figure it out. What do they do? What does a mitochondria do? It makes energy for the cell, right? It makes energy. It makes ATP for the cell by breaking down some type of carbohydrate, okay? It utilizes oxygen as well, right? So that's an important part. And chloroplasts actually transfer, transform light energy into and store it as chemical energy in the form of glucose, in the form of sugar, all right? And chloroplasts, and chloroplasts are found in plants and algae and other site of photosynthesis. <clears throat> One other important thing is a peroxisome. A peroxisome is like a, a vacuole, all right, an opening a compartment within the cell that is important for oxidation, all right? It's an oxidative organelle, which means it breaks down free oxygen species that would otherwise cause problems in the cell. Okay, so look through those. So, but where do the mitochondria and, and chloroplasts come from? All right, <clears throat> some characteristics of these two. They are enclosed by a double membrane. All right, so they have their own double membrane. They have a membrane. They, within themselves, they contain free ribosomes and DNA. What do you know about cells, free living cells? What do all cells have to have? DNA. DNA. What else do all cells have to have? A membrane. What else do all cells have to have? Ribosomes. So that's three of the four things right there. Right? So th that evidence suggests what? That's evidence that supports the fact that at some point, chloroplasts and mitochondria were free living cells on their own. Okay, those couple things, all right, and the fact that they grow and reproduce somewhat independently, all right, they, that tells you that that's what we use for evidence and support what we call the endosymbiont theory of origin of mitochondria and chloroplasts. That at some point in time, right, they were free living organisms, much like bacteria and, photosynth and, and photosynthetic bacteria that are present in the world today. They are very similar, okay? But at some point in time, a, a eukaryotic cell that end ended up with a uh, membrane enveloped nucleus engulfed or brought in somehow a mitochondria, another bacterial cell that was free living. And hey, I can offer you, there's a deal that was sparked. The bigger cell with the, with the nucleus, the eukaryotic cell said, I can offer you <coughs> plenty of free space and plenty of uh, energy. All right, sugars, 
And in return, you break that down and you offer me ATP, and we're going to be happy together. All right? And that's what happened. That's your endosymbiont theory. That an early ancestor of eukaryotic cells somehow engulfed first a non-photosynthetic non prokaryotic cell, which formed an endosymbiont relationship. What does endosymbiont mean? What's endo? What does that mean? In or within. Okay. <clears throat> What's symbiosis? What's symbiosis? It's a relationship between two organisms, right, where they were going to need to interact together. So they're going to live together, right? One's going to live within the other one. That's what it is. So the mitochondria is an endosymbiont, meaning that it's going to live within this eukaryotic cell. So first, the mitochondria was engulfed, okay? And then second, somewhere down the line, okay, you get, you get the merging, you end up with the mitochondria, and then at least one of these cells may have taken up a photosynthetic prokaryotic cell. Right, so first, we, there's a engulfing of the mitochondria, that establishes eukaryotic cells, and then at least one of, that, of those cells engulfed a chloroplast and then give rise to photosynthetic uh, excuse me, photosynthetic eukaryotic cells, right, such as plants and other, uh, other cells that contain <coughs> chloroplasts. All right, so there's a progression there. Why, what evidence do you know about plant cells that suggest that the mitochondria came first? What if it were opposite? What if the chloroplast came first? What if the chloroplasts were engulfed first? Do, cell, do plant cells have mitochondria? Yes or no? Yes, they do. Okay? That's evidence to support that. Right there, the fact that plant cells have mitochondria is evidence to support that the mitochondrion was engulfed first. Because if the chloroplast came first, and then they diverged somehow, then all eukaryotic cells would have chloroplasts, and only some plant cells wouldn't have mitochondria. Right? So think about it flip-wise. We know that plant cells, photosynthetic cells, have chloroplasts, but not all eukaryotic cells are photosynthetic. But all eukaryotic cells have mitochondria. Right? Plants and animals, etc. So have to come first. And this is the, the diagram that's sh showing this. Okay? So you have your ancestor of your eukaryotic cells. Note there's, a, uh, there's an endomembrane system, there's a nuclear, uh, nuclear envelope. There's no mitochondria yet. Right? So at this point, the cell is surviving on providing, uh, generating ATP <coughs> through glycolysis, right? A cellular. A process that produces a very small amount of ATP. It engulfs the mitochondrion, it develops and engulfs. Now the mitochondria produce large amounts of ATP through cellular respiration using oxygen, right, breaking things down and allowing that, those cells to work together. And at some point, the chloroplast then is engulfed, right? That's your endosymbiont theory. It gives explanation to why cells have mitochondria and chloroplasts. Questions on that? All right. So mitochondria, they're going to break down <clears throat> their structure. They are composed of a double membrane. Okay. They are a smooth outer membrane and an inner membrane folded into cristae. All right. So it kind of looks like this. Here's your smooth outer membrane. Then you have an inner membrane that is folded. All right, so those folds are cristae, right? The inner membrane can make, uh, makes two compartments, the intermembrane space. So this space right in here, that's your 
intermembrane space. Okay? So there's different parts of this mitochondria. This is very important when we talk about cellular respiration. All right? When we talk about how the mitochondria produce energy, this is the place that we're going to, we're going to look, we're going to know the inner membrane in blue, the outer membrane in black, and the space in between them is very important. Because we're, what, and the way it works is that, <coughs> excuse me, they're going to, the, the mitochondria are going to move hydrogen ions into that intermembrane space and produce a concentration gradient. Okay? Lots of hydrogen ions in this space, and they want to go back, and they're going to use that in order to uh, produce ATP. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> so, the two, what you end up with is the intermembrane space and the mitochondrial matrix. The matrix is this part in the middle, right here. This is your matrix part, right? And then you have the intermembrane space. Some of the steps of cellular respiration are done across this. This is the important part. We're gonna, this inner membrane, some of it's going to happen on the matrix on, within the inner membrane, and some of it's going to happen in the intermembrane space. Okay? The folding allows for a large surface area for the synthesis of ATP. <coughs> okay? So... What do we have to do? What is this in another example of in biology? Why are we talking about the structure of, my, of mitochondria? It's a relationship between structure and function. Okay? The structure of the double membrane, the increased surface area, allows for the maximal function for cellular respiration and the production of ATP. Okay? So this is what it looks like again, right? Diagram, mitochondria. Here's the free ribosomes and DNA. That's right, very reminiscent of prokaryotic cells and bacteria, which you look like, like free floating already. Okay, and then this is the uh, electron micrograph showing a mitochondria. Questions on that? <clears throat> now, chloroplasts are somewhat similar in structure. Okay, they have a double membrane. Actually, they have a very complex uh, in membrane structure. Okay? They contain chlorophyll, all right? plenty of other enzymes and proteins that are important for photosynthesis. We know that chlorophyll, well, chlorophyll, chlorophyll, more like borophyll. No. Uh, chlorophyll is found in leaves, and chloroplasts are found in leaves and other green organs of plants and algae because they perform photosynthesis. Okay, the structure of these includes thylakoids, <clears throat> right? It's not just a, a simple double membrane like we, taught, well, like we saw in mitochondria. It is a very, it's more complex, right? So the thylakoids are actually membranous sacs. So the, the kind of chunks or vacuoles or vesicles of membrane that contain chlorophyll, all right? Those stacks are stacked like, or those sacks are stacked like pancakes into what we call a granum, <clears throat> okay? And then stroma is the internal fluid, right, where those sacks are, the stuff that's between all the thylakoids, okay? Now, the chloroplast is one group of, of organelles that include uh, we're called plastids, okay? So let's see what a chloroplast looks like. I'm not going to attempt to draw this one, all right? So like I said, a, a more complex structure. <coughs> Double membrane, intermembrane space, same as other mitochondria, but within the matrix, where, what, where the matrix of a mitochondria would be, you have this stroma and these thylakoids. Membranous sacs would have chlorophyll that allow for the capture of light energy. Okay? 
and you see in the electron micrograph over here that those dark kind of spots, dark rectangles, are actually the thylakoids that are, that are stacked up. That's what a granum is, right? So these are little thylakoids that are stacked on top of one another, your pancake stacks, okay? And you also note that they are all linked. They're not really separate. They're all linked to one another, all right, which is important in and of itself, all right? And you see down here, chloroplasts in red in the, in the colorized, uh, electron micrograph to show you that it's very uh, dispersed throughout the cell. <clears throat> Why is it important that they're dispersed where well, they cover the entire cell of a photosynthetic cell? What was that again, Brett? Yeah, to absorb as much light as possible. More surface area, more light, right? That allows for more efficient photosynthesis. Okay? Last little one is peroxisomes, all right? And this is important in oxidation. These are specialized vacuoles, okay? You talked about, you read about vacuoles, hopefully, okay, in the beginning of chapter four, okay? But peroxisomes have enzymes and that produce hydrogen peroxide, okay? And then they convert it to water. What's hydrogen peroxide? is what? Hmm? H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. They convert it to water, plus what? Oxygen. Plus oxygen, right? Have you heard of free oxy reactive oxygen species? Have you heard of those? No, have you heard about antioxidants? Yeah. How many of you heard of antioxidants? What do they do? They help build up your immune system. Yes, kind of. They get rid of these free moving oxygens. Okay? So these are important because they actually, oxidation occurs, right? Which is um, oxidation is losing, right? Losing electrons. Electrons are going to be lost somewhere. All right, and then they, they end up reacting with other stuff. If this is a reactive oxygen species, okay, it's not stable. It wants to react with something. But then when you have an antioxidant, it's something in your body that reacts with this and prevents it from reacting with other proteins that can be important. Okay? Like their job is to absorb these extra things right, and prevent them from causing damage to other cellular structures. Okay, so <clears throat> here's a peroxisome kind of wedged in the middle there. Why is it important when we're talking about a mitochondria and a chloroplast that we talk about this? What are mitochondria and chloroplasts doing? They're helping to create what? Energy, okay? And when you create energy in the way it's created, the, the process it actually builds up a lot of these reactive oxygen species. So the peroxisome catches them and keeps them from causing trouble in the cell. Questions on peroxisomes, mitochondria, and or chloroplasts. Now peroxisomes do not, are not like, they're not in the endosymbiote type. Okay, they're really a vesicle with some specialized enzymes that are produced by the cell, they are not, they don't have a double membrane, they don't have DNA, they don't have free ribosomes. <clears throat> okay, so they're not a, an ancestor or a descendant, excuse me, descendant of some other type of prokaryotic cell. <clears throat> okay, uh, I did not have you cover in your study guides, the cytoskeleton, because it's a little more complex than I wanted you to go through. Most of you have probably covered the nucleus before, yes? Right, so same thing with the endoplasmic reticulum, and hopefully you understand the function of it as well. All right, so that's, pretty, that's a lot more straightforward than the cytoskeleton, okay? But 
the cytoskeleton. Cyto, every time you see that suffix cyto, it refers, it refers to cell. So really, this is the cell skeleton. All right, and what does your skeleton do? Supports, protects, right? What do you think the cytoskeleton does? Supports and protects, right? We're not, it's, we're not very original when we come to naming stuff. It, we function, name, pretty much, uh, pretty close in terms of uh, relationships, <clears throat> okay? But it does organize cell structures, and it provides um, an anchoring point and a movement point for organelles. Okay, we talk, basically organelles move in the cell, yes? You agree with that? Well, how do they move? They just float around? No. Some of it's very directed. Okay? You'll see that in a little bit. But this is the cytoskeleton. Kind of a, a crazy looking structure. All right, and what you're looking at right there are two different, <coughs> red and green, two different elements of the cytoskeleton. Okay? In red, you have microfilaments, which is one aspect, one subunit of the, the entire cytoskeleton. All right? You'll see the red is kind of in different places, yes? Different places than the green. There are places where they come together, and you can kind of see that in yellow, where they, where they co-localize. <clears throat> but the green is tubulin, microtubule. Okay, <clears throat> and they kind of look like a spider web originating from the middle out. All right, there's a microtubule organizing center that we'll talk about, and we'll talk about actin filaments as well. And there's another part of it that's not, another part of the cytoskeleton that's not labeled here, intermediate filaments. All right, so there's really three parts to the cytoskeleton, three big ones. Okay? But roles, support, number one, right? You saw from that picture that it allowed, gives the cell its shape, right? The two microtubules push out, and also the, the actin filaments, the microfilaments attached to cells, atta like allow for attachment, and they allow for the cell to, to have shape and structure, okay? Cells move, do you agree? Yes? I mean, even cells that are attached to your, that are attached to something, a plate, right, in an incubator, it still moves, right? You cut, you get a cut, eventually those cells are gonna migrate and are gonna heal that wound, yes? Okay, well how does that happen? How does a cell move if it has this cytoskeleton? What does this cytoskeleton have to be? Flexible, it has to be dynamic, okay? It's not stagnant. It's not just built and stay there, okay? It is built and it can be broken down in different parts, right? So if I wanted the cell to move, you know, a certain way, if I had my cell here, and I want it to move this way so that it's eventually going to go like this, right? And then, you know, it's going to look like that. Say the red being the the side of the cell that's moving towards, right? So red being eventually, uh, let's, let's draw that a different way. Okay, let's say, so this is your original cell, okay? And this cell is going to move, okay, so that this, this edge is going to move this way, okay? So eventually you're going to end up at this red part, this front, okay? So that's the cell front, the edge of the cell, okay? So how is that cell going to go from the black line here to here? Does it have to push out? 
is the, uh, is the membrane just going to go on its own? Or how are we going to do it, Brett? Like an anchor and a pull system? There is a little bit of an anchor and a pull system, right? And there's also a pushing system. So we're going to push the membrane out after we make an anchor. Right, so those two parts that we just talked about, that microtubules in green, are going to push out the membrane after the red spots, the, the uh, microfilaments, produce an anchor and pull it. Motility. Okay, how cells move is dependent upon this. <clears throat> how things within the cell move also depend upon these. Okay, so if I want to, if I have a cell, let's, let's, here's my, our cell, right? Nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum, we know the ER, we'll call this the rough ER, right? What does the rough ER do? Produces what? Proteins, okay? So now it produces a protein, it produces a vesicle with a bunch of proteins inside. And I want those proteins eventually to get out here. How does... This vesicle get to the membrane. Does it just eventually get there? Floating around, happy as can be, it'll get there eventually. A bubble in the air that's floating in the wind. That's, that's not efficient. Okay? So if I had a track that this vesicle could follow... That would, make, be, that would kind of pull it along, eventually get to the membrane, and allow the protein out. That would be much faster. You agree? Yes. And that's what, that's what the cell does. Okay? So it utilizes the cytoskeleton as a highway to pull things along. All right? And it does this through molecular motors, such as dyne. Okay? So here's a microtubule. Right? You see this is in green, the microtubule, right? That's an element of the cytoskeleton. Here's a, a, a vesicle, a couple vesicles, that are attached to that microtubule and this molecular motor. There's a motor on there that's going to move along the microtubule and stepwise pull it along until it goes where it needs to go. Okay. <clears throat> so motor proteins that actually walk along hydrolyzing ATP and pull them along. So motility not only for the whole cell, but within the cell as well. So moving parts along. Questions on the fun functions of the cytoskeleton. So support, shape, right, but also movement structure. Yes? Uh, so microtubules <coughs> push out the cell. And then the microfilaments, like they're structured in like a circular, right? Yes. You, you'll see it. We'll, we'll, when we go through the components, you'll see it a little bit better. Okay. Okay. I was just going to ask, like, what the microfilament, like, how it helps with the structure. Does it just keep it, like, the same circular shape? They allow for contact points. All right. So if I was to look so. Within the cell. So most of the time, if I, yes, it, well, I've been drawing cells like this, right? And that's looking from the, from the top down, through the cell. What if we look from the side? The cell was like this, right? And here's our little, our, our nucleus, we're, doing, we're looking basically like this, from the side. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So here's our plate. Say this cell is, you know, growing on a plate. That's our plate, right? So now how, like... The cell does, isn't just kind of floating there, right? The mammalian cells, animal cells, have to be attached to something in order to grow, right? And so your attachment points are actually these little points on here, right? So if I was to draw them along, they're kind of going like this. And you see them underneath the cell. But as you're looking through, it looks like they're within the cell, but they're actually underneath. If you were to look to the side, you see that they are underneath. But then that's near impossible to do. You can't really do that, right? So, but the, uh, the understanding is that these are attachment points for that. So these anchoring 
points are the microfilaments, right? And then within the cell, we have our microtubules that push out, right? And it kind of looks like this from here, right? So they will, they will push out, they'll push out the membrane as it needs to, and then as it pushes out, this part, say this cell's going to go this way, <coughs> Right, we'll have to make a new a, a, a attachment point and then break up old attachment points to allow the cell to move in a certain way. So those are outside of the cell? They are, <clears throat> yeah, they are outside and within. Right, so they're both. <clears throat> Three parts. Right, we have microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. Microtubules okay, are the largest part. They are the th largest, thickest cytoskeleton, cytoskeletal element. Okay? So even though it says microtubules, it is the biggest. All right? N the next are intermediate filaments. All right? They're kind of in between. And then you have your microfilaments, which are also called actin filaments, and they are the smallest. Okay? So in order of size... All right, from smallest to biggest, microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. Right, that can be somewhat confusing because of the microtubule. Right, micro does not mean, in this case, the smallest. This table is very important. It gives you everything that you really need. Okay? <clears throat> the structure of microtubules is a hollow tube. That's why it's a tubule. It's a hollow tube composed of Tubulin subunits. So tubulin's a protein. There's alpha and beta ones. And they link together to form <coughs> this <coughs> helical tube. That's hollow. Okay? They function in maintenance of cell shape, cell motility, especially in cilia and flagella. All right? We know what cilia do. We know what flagellum do, right? <coughs> Microtubules make up the structure of those two, uh, those two motil modal structures, cilia and flagellum. All right? And so it also has to do with organelle movements within the cell. And very important, during mitosis, during cell division, microtubules actually pull chromosomes apart. Right? <laughs> they actually pull them apart during cell division. <clears throat> okay. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Gosh. Microfilaments, actin filaments. Okay, they are smaller, and they, you see the diameter of them. They're composed of actin, right, and actin in a helical nature. So, we're going to add subunits here. Why is it important that these are? Adding subunits. So if I can add subunits, what else can I do? I can take them away. What is that important for? If I'm going, to, if the cell's going to move, how am I going to push that cell membrane out? By adding subunits. Okay, I continue to add subunits, the membrane's going to be pushed, right? I'm making it longer. Okay? And if I have to break down other parts, I can take the subunits away, right? Dynamic. This is dynamic. They can be put together and broken apart, right? They can be changed, okay? The intermediate filaments are, are less dynamic, right? They're a little more stagnant. You see, they form the nuclear lamina. What's the nuclear lamina? So the, nuclear, the nucleus has a shape, right? You look in a microscope, you look at cells in a microscope, what's the nucleus look like? A sphere. A sphere. It's round. It's circular, right? It's pretty much that shape all the time, right? How? Why? Does it have to have something in it that holds it that shape? Yes. These intermediate fil filaments give this lamina, it's a structure to the shape of the nucleus. All right, it's like a netting. 
right, that gives it structure. <clears throat> Helps maintain cell shape as well. And really a big one, right, the anchorage of nucleus and certain other organelles to uh, the cell. All right, so now we, go, we can go through them all the, each is basically going through each of the, the next couple slides, go through each of the bits, uh, the three components of the cytoskeleton like we just did. All right, I gave you the table, we went through it. All right, so we can go through it pretty quickly. All right, in terms of microtubules, there's a part, a point, where they organize and they radiate from. Radiate, what does that mean? Here's the center, radiate, it means kind of come out in all directions, right? Those are arrows, poorly drawn arrows, okay? So there are a couple different structures that you need to know. <coughs> Centrosomes and centrioles, okay? In, all, in animal cells, microtubules arise from a microtubule organizing center called the centrosome, right? So here's your centrosome. The microtubules are going to radiate out from that point, right? So there's a starting point, and we know which direction to go, okay? The centrosome actually has a pair of cylindrical centrioles, okay? each with nine triplets. So nine, three rings. So three rings times nine, okay? In a, in a center, in a circle, all right? That's what a centriole has. <clears throat> each centriole has nine triplets of microtubules. So it, it is a, it's a collection point where all these microtubules come into, all right? What does it look like? It's like this, okay? Here are your nine triplets. Okay, you're actually showing <coughs> plasma membrane <coughs> portion of a, a microtubule doublet. Okay, this is cilia and flagella. We'll talk about them in a second. All right, here's your nine triplets. Centrioles, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Triplets, are, and they are arranged perpendicular to one another. Okay. They're usually some, somewhere around one side of the nucleus, right? And it is a organizing center. This is where the microtubule cytoskeleton will originate from, okay? Questions on centrioles. Two centrioles make what? One centrosome. Okay, and all animals, animals have it. All right, our last thing we'll talk about today are cilia and flagella. So microtubules are important for this, the movement of these two structures. All right, they are composed of nine doublets, not triplets, nine doublets and plus two more inside. So you have, whoop, so two, that's a doublet, and we have nine of them in a ring, and then in the middle, we have two more. Okay, that's, that's the structure of a cilia or a flagella, All right? And what do cilia and flagella do? So they beat, right? They move back and forth. That, all they do is just kind of this motion, left to right, left to right, or up and down, up and down, Okay. The structure of the microtubules allow that to happen. <clears throat> so where are, where are cilia and flagella usually in the cell? Are they in here? They're on the outside, right? So a flagellum is a long extension and cilia are shorter extensions, but they are outside of the plasma membrane. So there is part of it that actually is encompassed and enclosed by the plasma membrane. All right, there's an, uh, an anchoring point where the microtubules anchor or attach to the cytoskeleton of the cell. 
all right, and your motor protein. What, what, when I say motor protein, what do you think? There's movement, okay? So this motor protein dynein is actually going to change shape and cause the movement of the cilia and the flagellum. All right, the structure. So here's the structure. Here's your nine doublets, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Plus the two in the middle. That's your central microtubule. You see here, right, they are attached to the central microtubule by other proteins. So your doublets are attached, and then you have these other uh, proteins that attach the doublets to each other. Those proteins, the attachment is important for the movement. Okay? You break that, mo that motor protein is going to change shape and cause the movement of the cilia and the flagella one way or the other. Okay? Then your basal body, this is the anchoring point right here. What does that look like? It looks like the centriole. Okay? So the extension, the cilia and the flagellum, look different than the basal body. The basal body looks more like the organizing center, the attachment. All right? And then it goes through how the walking, the movement of dining move things around. We'll stop there for today.